This is Bone Chillers to disturb your dreams. Dare to join us? Click subscribe. Ring the bell. But remember, we cannot guarantee your safety from the nightmares that await. Prepare to be thrilled, chilled, and filled with a sense of dread you'll find nowhere else. Welcome to the darkness. We've been waiting. The gatekeeper's pet. Lillian was the perfect picture of charm and grace. Her bewitching smile, cascading brunette curls, and captivating emerald eyes drew people in. Little did they know, she was a gatekeeper of an alternate reality, capable of summoning the Pale One, a monstrous humanoid from the other side, with her enchanting smile. Lillian's duty was to maintain balance between realities. She was assigned to eliminate those who posed a threat to this equilibrium. The Pale One, her monstrous pet, was her instrument of chaos and order. At first, she took her role seriously. But over time, Lillian's enchanting smile began to flicker with sadistic delight. The fear, the panic, the utter mayhem that ensued when the Pale One was unleashed, it started to amuse her. She found herself invoking her pet more often, targeting not just those who disturbed the balance, but innocent bystanders too. It was as if their fear and their struggle for survival was a performance just for her. The boundary between good and evil began to blur in her mind. One day, in the quiet town of Serenity, Lillian targeted a quaint café bustling with innocent lives. Her malicious smile summoned the Pale One, who materialized amidst the café patrons. It was an eerie figure, towering over the townsfolk, with an ashen skin devoid of any color. Its eyes were a chilling white, void of emotion, yet filled with a hunger that echoed Lillian's own perverse delight. The chaos unfolded as expected. The townsfolk screamed and scrambled for the exits. The Pale One moved with a terrifying speed, catching them one by one, its chilling touch reducing them into nothing more than a wisp of energy. Lillian watched the scene unfold, the corners of her mouth twitching upwards in a cruel smirk. In the midst of this horror, a little girl with golden curls and eyes full of terror caught Lillian's attention. For the first time, a pang of guilt seized her. She saw her own reflection in those innocent eyes. It was a cruel reality check. Her amusement was the child's terror, her pleasure the child's pain. Lillian tried to withdraw the pale one, but it was too late. The creature had locked onto the little girl. She was its next target. The child was too frightened to run, tears streaming down her face. No! Lillian screamed, but the pale one, once unleashed, would not cease until it had drained every life in its vicinity. Her pet was no longer under her control, Lillian did the unthinkable. She stepped between the creature and the child, blocking its path. The pale one hesitated, its cold, empty eyes locking onto Lillian. The gatekeeper versus her pet, it was a standoff. I won't let you harm her, Lillian declared, her voice echoing through the cafe. Her bewitching smile was gone, replaced with a firm grimace. The pale one, never having faced defiance from its summoner, seemed confused. Taking advantage of its hesitation, Lillian used her powers in a way she had never done before. She smiled, not her usual charming, enchanting smile, but a soft, remorseful one. The pale one shivered, its form wavering, and vanished back to the realm from where it had been summoned. Silence fell. The cafe was empty, save for the little girl, and Lillian, standing alone amidst the wreckage. The child, though shaken, was unharmed. The monstrous gatekeeper fell to her knees, consumed with guilt. Lillian's duty had been to maintain balance, but she had lost her own. As she looked at the innocent child before her, she made a vow. She would atone for her actions, no longer would she summon the Pale One for her amusement. The horror of the day served as a stern reminder of the true terror, not the monstrous Pale One, but the monstrous part of her that had reveled in the chaos. From that day forward, she would fight against it, becoming the gatekeeper she was meant to be, not the one who fed on fear and chaos. The gatekeeper's pet was a story not of supernatural terror but of the terrifying potential within us, a tale that reminded us of the balance we all must maintain, the line between good and evil that we must never blur. 
Lillian's story would serve as a warning to future gatekeepers, a horrifying testament to what could happen when power fell into the hands of those who relished chaos. Waning Luminary In the subterranean city of Lumera, hidden beneath an unending mountain range, lived a young girl named Ada. This underground haven was a labyrinth of tunnels and caves, with sprawling architectures etched from the womb of the earth. In Lumera, day and night held no meaning, and the only source of light were the bioluminescent fungi clinging to the cavern walls, and the two ceremonial candles that Ada lit every year. These candles were no ordinary lights. They served as the only barrier between the city and a monstrous skeletal entity known only as the Waning Luminary. With hollow eyes of hollowed obsidian and a bony structure taller than the tallest stalagmite, the Waning Luminary was a sight to behold and fear. It remained in its chamber, encased within a cocoon of ancient stalactites, its gaze fixated on the flickering candles that kept it dormant. But this year, something went awry. The candles that once shone with an unfaltering flame now flickered weakly, casting long, threatening shadows that danced along the cavernous walls. The monster inched closer, its hollow eyes hungry for the fading light. A distraction crept upon Ada, the whispers that seemed to emanate from the deeper bowels of the city. The voices were old, older than Lumera itself, weaving tales of forgotten epochs and lost civilizations. They spoke of Ada's ancestors, her heritage entwined with the city's origins. It was said that her bloodline was cursed, tied to the existence of the waning luminary. Ada was the last of her lineage, tasked with the sacred ceremony to keep the beast at bay. The whispers, however, had become a constant humming in her ears, making her question everything she'd been told. The day of the annual ceremony arrived. Ada held the precious candles, their waxy surfaces marred with the fingernail marks of her ancestors, fear etched into their timeless existence. Her heart pounded against her ribs like a primal drum as she approached the monstrosity. Its form loomed ahead, the dim candlelight casting an eerie glow over its skeletal silhouette. As Ada began the ceremony, the whispers grew louder, transforming into dissonant screams. The words started to form a cohesive message. They spoke of a past where Lumera was not a prison but a sanctuary. The waning luminary was not a monster, but a guardian, its skeletal form a symbol of death and rebirth, a cycle every city must undergo. The whispers claimed that the candles didn't keep the creature dormant but imprisoned, breaking the natural cycle of decay and renewal. Conflicted, Ada stumbled upon a decision. The beast's hollow eyes bore into her soul as the whispers enticed her to extinguish the candles. With a shaking hand, Ada brought her fingers to the flame. She felt the warmth of the fire, the centuries of fear embedded in its light, and the flickering hope of a new beginning. Making a choice that no ancestor of hers had dared to, Ada pinched the flames. Darkness enveloped Lumera. A deafening silence hung in the air. Ada could hear her own heartbeat, a solitary rhythm echoing in the void. She waited. A fear that the whispers had lied clawed at her sanity. But then, in the pitch-black darkness, she saw it. Two glimmers of obsidian light, no longer hollow, but brimming with an ancient vitality. The waning luminary arose, not with the roar of a monster, but with the grace of a guardian. The underground city trembled, not in fear but in anticipation. From the monster's skeletal form, a pulse of energy erupted, its shockwave illuminating the caverns. The bioluminescent fungi grew brighter, bathing Lumera in an ethereal glow. As the echoes of the past silenced, the whispers turned into voices of gratitude. For the first time in centuries, Lumera was truly alive, no longer under the suffocating shadow of fear. Ada stood in the heart of the city, a beacon of change, her mysterious past unraveled, and her courage burning brighter than any candle. She had freed not only the waning luminary but also Lumera from an eternal curse. Tresses of Fate Richard had always loved his daughter's hair, a fiery red cascade that seemed to glow in the sunlight. 
So when Lily pointed out a doll in the middle of the forest, its porcelain face framed by hair the same vibrant shade, he felt a chill crawl down his spine. There was something too familiar about the doll, something too uncanny. In the weeks that followed, Lily's hair began to thin. As each strand fell, she grew weaker, losing her vitality, the sparkle in her eyes dimming. It didn't take long for Richard to connect her deteriorating health to the doll's deteriorating hair. Richard returned to the woods, hoping to find answers. He dug around the spot where they'd found the doll and unearthed a small, rotting chest. Inside lay an ancient book, its leather-bound cover cracked with age. Tresses of Fate, the title read. Flipping through the parchment pages, Richard learned of an ancestral curse cast by a scorned witch centuries ago. The witch, Ilara, had been betrayed by his ancestor, a man who had promised to marry her, but instead, married another woman out of duty. Enraged, Ilara sought revenge, cursing his bloodline to suffer the same fate she had, losing everything they loved, strand by strand. The doll was the embodiment of the curse. Each strand of hair it lost, mirrored by Lily's loss, was a symbolic representation of the witch's vengeance, a macabre intertwining of past and present, fate and sorrow. Desperate to save Lily, Richard sought the help of a local occultist who instructed him on how to break the curse. He had to return the doll to the witch, along with an offering of his own hair, a symbolic gesture of bearing the pain intended for his daughter. The woods had always been eerie, but that night, under the waning moon, they were a nightmare. Richard ventured deeper into the forest, following the occultist's instructions, carrying the doll and a lock of his own hair. The air grew colder as he arrived at a decrepit, forgotten cabin hidden among the trees. A spectral figure stood in the doorway, her translucent skin glowing in the dim moonlight. Richard felt his breath hitch, it was Ilara, unchanged by the centuries that had passed. Silently, he approached, placing the doll and the lock of his hair at her feet. Her ghostly eyes bore into his. He felt an inexplicable sorrow, a deep-seated pain that could only belong to a broken heart. I bear your curse, Richard began, his voice echoing through the silent woods. But my daughter shall bear it no more. I offer you my hair, a symbol of my suffering. Let the curse pass from Lily to me. A chilling wind swept across the clearing, the spectral witch studying Richard. Her haunting gaze softened, her figure wavering as though battling an internal war. Finally, she reached down, picking up the doll and the lock of hair. With a swift motion, she tore at the doll's remaining hair, replacing it with Richard's. A searing pain coursed through Richard's skull, his own hair thinning rapidly. But the intense pain brought an undercurrent of relief, Lily would be saved. As the pain subsided, Ilara's ghostly figure began to fade. Your love has proven greater than the hatred I bore, she whispered, her voice barely a rustle of leaves. Your bloodline shall be cursed no more. When Richard returned home, Lily was sitting up in her bed, her hair thick and healthy, her eyes shining with life. He held her close, his hairless head resting atop hers, the curse lifted but the cost forever etched in their lives. Tresses of fate would remain a haunting tale of sacrifice, love, and the devastating consequences of vengeance, an unsettling reminder that past actions can ripple into future generations, twisting the threads of fate in terrifying, unexpected ways. The Radiant Abomination Dr. James Prescott, once a renowned molecular biologist, now a recluse in his dilapidated laboratory, was obsessed with the idea of creating bioluminescent life forms. Secluded from society, he spent his days and nights, concocting strange elixirs, barely resting, barely eating. One dreary midnight, two of his creations began to glow, another worldly radiance pulsating from within their glass containers. They were not mere organisms, but miniature ecosystems, microscopic, teeming worlds that glowed with an uncanny light. Fascinated, he studied them intently, yet, as the days passed, he observed an alarming rapidity in their evolution. They became grotesque, Lovecraftian abominations, miniature tentacled creatures that defied comprehension. He discovered, to his horror, they had a terrifying capacity, they could alter DNA, transforming any life form into something like themselves. He knew then the gravity of his mistake. These radiant aberrations, with their grotesque allure, 
held the power to corrupt humanity into nightmarish creatures, pulsating with an eerie, luminescent glow. Terrified, Prescott pondered how to destroy his dreadful creations. In the depths of despair, he dreamt of alien worlds teeming with grotesque, bioluminescent abominations. He saw a humanity transformed, writhing, pulsating masses of monstrous life, bereft of the sun's light, existing in an eternal, grotesque luminescence. Awakening in a cold sweat, he resolved to end this nightmare. His research pointed to a potential solution, a serum designed to destabilize their DNA, causing a rapid breakdown. His hands shook as he mixed the serum. His life's work, his dreams, his horrors, were to end tonight. With a deep breath, he injected the serum into the radiant abominations. The light within the bottles flickered, wavered, then intensified. The lab was filled with a blinding, alien radiance. In his horror, he saw the creatures grow, tentacles reaching out, touching the glass, then pushing, pressing, till with a sound like a million tiny screams, the glass shattered. Dr. Prescott fell back, shards of glass piercing his skin, the luminescent liquid splashing onto his body. He watched in terror as the radiant abominations crawled towards him, their many eyes glowing with an unholy light. Yet, he saw, to his surprise, they were shrinking, convulsing, their radiant light flickering. He realized the serum was working. His relief was cut short when he felt a sharp pain in his hand, looking down to see one had burrowed into his flesh. He screamed as it writhed under his skin, its glow illuminating his veins. He could feel it, altering, changing him from the inside. He watched as his skin took on an odd glow, the abomination dying even as it transformed him. In desperation, he grabbed a syringe, filled it with the serum, and plunged it into his glowing flesh. Agony racked his body as his own DNA destabilized. He writhed on the floor, the radiant light within him flickering, until, with a final convulsive gasp, it went out. His lab was plunged into darkness. He woke, days later, in the still darkness of his lab. The abominations were dead. He was still human. He had won, at a cost. He was a broken man, haunted by the horrors of his own making, haunted by the memory of the radiant abomination that almost brought about an unthinkable end. James Prescott shuttered his lab, destroyed his notes, and swore never to tread the treacherous path of forbidden knowledge again. He walked away from that place, carrying with him a scar that glowed faintly in the dark, a grim reminder of the radiant abomination he had unleashed upon the world, and the horrors of playing God. The Youth Eater Nathaniel was a young man trapped in an old man's body. He had once been a vibrant teenager, full of life, until he stumbled upon an artifact in an abandoned cellar that had plunged him into this nightmare. His eyes, now glowing an unnatural shade of gold, were the only indicators of the process. Every passing day, he aged dramatically. His once youthful face was a map of wrinkles, his hair silvery white, and his joints ached incessantly. His room was his sanctuary, a safe space where he prayed under the dim glow of an incandescent bulb and a cluster of flickering candles. The walls were lined with pages from ancient texts and hastily scribbled notes, interspersed with photographs of the artifact a nulled amulet, carved from an obsidian-like material and inlaid with unfamiliar symbols. One evening, as he sat huddled in his room, poring over another esoteric manuscript, a glimmer of hope sparked in his heart. He traced his fingers over an etched figure that bore an uncanny resemblance to the amulet. The text referred to it as the Talisman of Eternitas, an ancient entity that fed on youth, offering immortality in exchange. This piece of information stung him, for he never made such a pact. It was a curse he wanted to break. With newfound determination, Nathaniel started researching a way to reverse the effects. Days turned into weeks as he pored over dusty volumes and online occult forums. His eyes shone brighter with each passing day, and his body aged faster than it ever had, but he remained undeterred. One evening, as his eyes flicked over another ancient transcript, a word caught his attention, Rituali Inverso, the reverse ritual. The text explained it as a procedure to invert the effects of dark pacts. It was an arduous process, requiring sacred relics and a drop of blood from an innocent. He had most of the items already, 
at the blood. Nathaniel knew he had to tread carefully to prevent this entity from victimizing another innocent. Nathaniel remembered his younger sister, Emily. She was merely seven, full of youthful energy and innocence. He would not let Eternitas claim her. He quietly entered her room one night, gently pricking her finger while she slept, apologizing in hushed whispers as she stirred but thankfully, did not wake. In the glow of the candles and the bulb, Nathaniel began the ritual. He placed the sacred relics in a circle, placing the amulet in the center. Then, with a shaky hand, he squeezed Emily's blood onto the amulet. The symbols lit up instantly, the ancient curse crackling in the air. A voice, like the rustling of dry leaves, echoed in the room. Foolish mortal, what do you think you're doing? It hissed. With a deep breath, Nathaniel recited the incantation from the text. The voice grew angrier with each word he spoke, but Nathaniel didn't waver. His heart pounded against his ribcage, the fear of failure gnawing at his mind. Finally, he uttered the last word of the incantation. A blinding light enveloped the room, making Nathaniel shield his eyes. When he dared to open them again, the amulet lay lifeless on the floor, its menacing glow extinguished. His body felt different, lighter. The ache in his joints was gone and his mirror reflected a teenager once again. The glow in his eyes, too, had faded. Relief washed over him. He had defeated Eternitas, breaking the curse, and saving himself and others from a similar fate. From then on, Nathaniel devoted his life to studying ancient artifacts, vowing to protect others from falling victim to such dark enchantments. He had learnt a valuable lesson, that there was nothing more precious than living one's life naturally growing old at the right pace. The allure of immortality had led him down a path he would never forget, a path that had turned him into the youth eater. But now, he was free. Thank you for watching, and remember the darkness awaits. Until our paths cross again, stay fearful and stay subscribed.